It's a national media education conference that's going to be held in Austin next weekend. But it's the media in our everyday life that's the subject of Austin Faith Dialogue as well. We invite you to stay tuned. Austin Faith Dialogue at the crossroads of religion and life. A series highlighting the cultural and social interactions between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KXAN. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. Hello, I'm Richard Thompson in behalf of the Austin Area Interreligious Ministries bidding you welcome. Today our show happens to relate to what's going to be happening in Austin just in a few days. It's going to be at the Double Tree North that uh, media educators from across the country are going to be gathering to talk about what their theme is, Unleashing Creativity, having to do with media education in this land. The meeting is going to be focused primarily on education within a secular context. But on Saturday, uh, on uh, June the 23rd, there's going to be one set of uh, workshops called God, Media, and Culture, Media Literacy in a Faith-Based Context. So we'll be coming to that today as well, but we're going to start with a couple of folks here in the community who are dealing with the educational side of this. Uh, first of all, Holly Custard, the Associate Director for KLRU's Educational Services. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be a presenter at that conference on the subject of new frontiers of media and education, digital TV, and the digital divide. Right. Holly, we're looking forward to hearing what you're going to have to say about that. Thank you. We're also welcoming Dr. Nancy Jennings, who is a lecturer at the University of Texas Radio, Television, and Film Department. A class that she's taught was uh, entitled Media, Marketing, and Children. And uh, Nancy, we're looking forward to hearing about this marketing and children aspect of things. But first of all, uh, it's a mouthful, Holly. <laughs> the digital divide and uh, the digital TV mm -hmm. and how this is a new frontier of media and education. What, what are you going to be saying at this conference that will bring out the meaning of that? Well, there's going to be three of us uh, in the past. There's going to be a representative from PBS in Virginia and another representative from Wisconsin Public Television. And we're all going to be talking about digital television, defining what it is, which I'll explain a little bit about it because it's, it's new and a lot of people haven't heard about it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also talking about the digital divide. Um, digital divide is a complex issue, and I, I'll give a brief overview. I'm not an expert on this by any means, um, but basically it's those individuals and groups of individuals who have access to technology and the training um, of that technology and those who do not. And the issue is very complex. Uh, it has to do with economics and race and physical ability and yeah. age and lots of things. So it's not as easy as just saying people who have access and people who don't. There's lots of reasons why. Right. Okay. Um, but as a public broadcasting station, we're very um, interested and concerned about that issue. Mm -hmm. um, digital television is a new technology that's coming around. Um, in 2003, KLRU will go digital. Um, the government has mandated that all stations go digital by 2006. Basically, what digital television is, it's a new way of sending the signal. So right now, we're getting the analog signal. Um, and by in 2003, consumers, viewers, will have to either purchase a set-top box, which is essentially a converter that you would put on your television set that you have today, right. which would allow you to receive the signal. <clears throat> Or if the standards become more regulated um, by then, you can buy a television set that's got what it takes inside oh, to receive. In, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be all one thing. All right. um, or you can have a chip in your computer that would receive those signals. So all of that is available now. It's a little mm -hmm. bit pricey, and a lot of people just don't know about it. And a lot of people in um, Austin, aren't, they're not, stations aren't broadcasting in digital yet. So it's not available, but it will be. Um, in larger markets, people are already broadcasting in digital. Okay. But what digital, let me just explain what digital is going to allow us to do and what we're going to be talking um, about at the conference right. because that's significant. Um, digital television basically is going to allow us to broadcast more 
content. So right now we've got one channel as KLRU in the community, mm -hmm. but when we go digital, we'll have access to five channels, maybe more than that by the time we, we convert. Um, so that's going to allow us to broadcast more content um, to the community. Another thing that digital television would allow us to do is send content and broadcast signals. So we might send a program to a school about media literacy and then we would also be sending data to that school. Maybe we would send teachers guides, maybe we would send um, quizzes that the students could answer after the program. So it would allow us to send data and, a, and the broadcast. Another thing that it would allow us to do and what we'll be talking about okay. at the conference right. is enhanced television. And basically right now PBS on a national level has been testing out enhanced television and it's taking components from the internet. You're like you have the best of the internet and the best of television one thing where the user is actually interacting with their television set. Yeah, I've heard about that. So that's that's really exciting for public television because we see a lot of opportunity. We've done um, trials on a national basis with programs like Scientific American Frontiers, um, Frank Lloyd Wright. There was a special on Frank Lloyd Wright, Itzhak Perlman. There's been lots of demos and pilots. Mm -hmm. What we're interested in and what we're talking about at the conference is how can we include the community and how can we, especially the K-12 community, in creating new content with this new technology because right now it just hasn't been done. And um, educationally I think there's a lot of value. I think a lot of people see educational value but we don't know what it is. So we're interested in having um, community members come together and explore what is the new technology going to allow us to do what can we do to harness the power of that new medium to better the community? And we're looking specifically at doing tests in the K-12 community. All right. So My goodness gracious, a that's, that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, for some of us, that's just sort of been on the periphery of our attention, that there's this change coming about <clears throat> for the broadcast uh, mm -hmm. industry and for everybody that's sitting at home watching, their, uh, watching the tube. Yeah. And, uh, and beyond that, now and more and more into the educational field. Now, Nancy, I had noted that uh, you taught this course at uh, the Radio, Television, and Film Department on media, marketing, and children. Mm -hmm. Now, that <clears throat> says to me that uh, you've got so many of these programs that are with the advertisers uh, targeting the, the kids. Is that, was that what that's about? Um, absolutely. Uh, when we think of the children, child as a consumer, um, it's really thinking of the child as a consumer in three different ways. Um, first, as a current consumer, that children are making purchases on their own, even by the age of kin in kindergarten, um, they're making independent purchases using their own money. Um, and so uh, the marketers are really kind of uh, tuning into that and making appeals to younger and younger sure, children. Right. Um, and then they're also, um, as influencers of parental parental and family purchases. Um, it's amazing how much influence a child will have on what type of cereal is purchased for the household, mm -hmm. and anywhere up to the type of computer and the type of software that's being purchased, and cars. Um, and then also as future consumers, because they're a market um, that can be tapped into as being brand loyal at a very young age, and then 20 years from now, um, they will have their continue their brand loyalty and hopefully pass that on to their family and so forth and so on. Brand well. loyalty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that just stirs the heart, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but you know, one of the things too, and I think especially in the second half of the show, we'll be talking about the ethical and the spiritual aspects of this because the presumption that we treat people beginning as infants as consumers is a big value question in itself knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing kind right. of thing. Absolutely. But meanwhile, I, I think it'd be helpful to uh, take a look at uh, a clip from the Center for Media Literacy that kind of highlights the, um, what, what media literacy is about and how this relates to media education. And one of the pr people here, uh, Renee Hobbs uh, at Harvard, is uh, on the tape, will be at the conference as well. And that'll give us something to react to in just uh, after about a minute. So really study the picture. Think about the photographer that took the picture and the images and the message that he's trying to get across, he or she is trying to get across. These fourth graders in Billerica, Massachusetts are exploring the complex power of images 
In a culture saturated with pictures, children need a set of skills to enable them to ask important questions about what they see, watch, and read. For too many years, educators have ignored, dismissed, or trivialized these. Newspapers, magazines, radio, film, and of course, television. Yet it is through media messages that we receive most of our information about the world. Now, as never before, media culture is our culture. I'm Renee Hobbs. In this program, we'll talk with experts and educators at the Harvard Institute on Media Education. We'll see how to analyze media messages and how students and teachers can apply these skills in the classroom. Most importantly, we'll discover why analyzing and creating media messages is an essential component of literacy for the information age. Okay, an essential component of literacy in the information age. Instead of just reading words, reading images. Uh, now, you were involved in a media literacy project locally here, were you not, Nancy? Yes. Can um, you tell us just in a minute before our break about that? Sure. I've taught a media literacy computer technology class in the uh, Del Valley Independent School District for the past three years. And um, it's been a wonderful experience um, to watch the children go from um, learning about uh, what media is and being able to produce their own media, um, taking a look at uh, um, different uh, stations. We've been to um, this station. We've been to um, the news, local newspaper just to, as different field trips. And it's just been phenomenal, uh, the type of exposure that they can, uh, they can get and the critical learning skills that they've been able to acquire. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they're talking about here in the, the video that's happening elsewhere is happening locally. Yes, sir. But what about locally here that you can uh, add to that? Well, we do, from KLRU's perspective, um, we have an early childhood program called Ready to Learn. And as part of that, uh, workshops that we go out into um, the schools for child care providers, uh, p uh, teen parents, parents, um, and we talk to them about how, do you, how can you appropriately watch television, children's television like Sesame Street or Arthur, and how can you maybe take a 10-minute clip of something that um, your child is learning and then apply um, some hands-on activities and then how can you also add in literature to that so instead of just watching half an hour of television passively how can you use television to help enforce things that you're trying to teach your children um, so we do a lot with that um, as a community we also invite um, dialogue about the digital divide about media literacy um, through the digital divide summit which KLRU has had two of those or KLRU rather um, and we invite the community to come in, and Tom Spencer, as the moderator for Austin Issue, will um, talk to the community about what does this mean, what are the issues for Austin, okay. and all of that is on our website if you want to take a look okay, at we'll it. Okay, we'll come back to that in Great. the second half. Let's be sure we get that website. But we do have to take a break now. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion about media education here in the capital city. Welcome back to Austin Faith Dialogue, where today our subject is media education. Uh, our discussion is occasioned by this uh, national meeting that's going to be held in Austin next weekend at the Double Tree North uh, Hotel. And uh, on Saturday of that day, there's a special emphasis on media literacy in a faith-based context. Uh, we have with us uh, today for uh, anticipating that, uh, Holly Custer, who's going to be leading a 
a workshop there on um, the digital divide, digital TV, uh, speaking out of her work with uh, KLRU. And Nancy Jennings, you won't be speaking at the conference, but uh, being at the University of Texas, you've been involved in media literacy efforts for some time uh, as you worked on your doctorate. Uh, I'd like to just uh, take a moment before we return to this issue of what are the ethical, spiritual implications of the digital divide and of your topic that you taught at UT on marketing and children. Um, on Saturday, the 23rd, from 9 in the morning and into the afternoon, there are a series of workshops uh, watching prime time through the lens of faith. Film studies in religious education, bringing faith and life closer together. Here's a good one. Streaming faith and spiritual machines, theology, and the digital culture. <laughs> now, <clears throat> after hearing you in the first half, Holly, I think that you could talk this guy's language. <laughs> uh, critical thinking in critical times, how to develop a media literacy focus in a faith-based setting, and... Are there core principles to faith-based media literacy education? And by the way, this presenter, uh, Sue Lockwood Summers uh, from Littleton, Colorado, I know works with the uh, PBS station up in Denver, mm. and she's one of the presenters coming in. But let's come to this issue. Uh, none of these actually touch what we might deal with here today, and that is what are the ethical implications Let's start with the digital divide. Mm -hmm. Is it between the haves and the have-nots as far as its information age goes? Well, I think that's, a, that's basically what it is and, and the reasons for that. I'm sure you can talk more to the subject, but um, say in the rural areas, you know, there's, there's less access to the technology that we have here in Austin than, say, our surrounding communities, and that's you know, a technical infrastructure issue. Um, we also have communities in Austin that have less access to the technology that others may have. And so ethically, is it correct for some people to have full access and full training and full knowledge and daily interaction with the technology and others who don't? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense um, on an economic level in terms of having a skilled workforce. I mean, and that's just one aspect of it. But the other aspect is just not right in a democracy to have uh, such a divide um, because it's such a a part of what our society is about today and if you don't have those skills and you don't have that access and you're not familiar with the technology can't use it effectively then you're at a disadvantage mm -hmm. economically and socially well KLRU as a nonprofit aspect of the broadcast community mm -hmm. is to help overcome that divide with the kinds of things you were talking about earlier yeah we um, our Austin issue, our public affairs program, uh, we held two community summits. The first one, we brought in um, various members of the community to talk about and identify what is the digital divide for Austin and the surrounding communities, what are the issues, who's doing what, and how can we work together to, to bridge this divide, to prevent a further divide. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting dialogue, and um, action groups came out of that meeting. New partnerships came out of that meeting. And a wonderful website, which is at the KLRU website, it's www.klru.org, and then you go to digital or uh, public square. Public when you go square. to public square, that's the link. That's the link, um, and you'll see Digital Divide Summit. And all the, almost all of the clips from that program are streamed, so you can actually watch the program on our website um, to find out what some of the issues were discussed about the Digital Divide in Austin. Um, some of the people, there's so many organizations in town who are working for this issue, and I think having that uh, broadcast for the community to know more about where is the divide, what are the issues, and then who's doing what, and how can I help, and how can I be a part of the okay. solution to that. Good. All right. Uh, Nancy, I know you've done some work in terms of this digital divide. Mm -hmm. um, I would like, however, to have us focus on what you've dealt with in terms of marketing and advertising. Uh, I've heard pediatricians say, that, you know, forget the pornography that may be on the mm -hmm. tube or the violence, but watch out for the advertising. Right. Um, absolutely. There's, there's definite reasons to look and, and to watch the advertising because, um, especially with pediatricians, a concern about children's health, um, uh, that children are being more attracted to food materials that aren't in their best interest, sugar-sweet 
uh, cereals, candies, um, juices, and, and just being able to teach children using media literacy um, to be able to look through the advertising and to be have a critical eye to it. And just because it's got pictures of fruit on the cover doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100% fruit juice uh, wow. as a product. So it's it's terribly important to think about issues of marketing and, and issues of media literacy, how those two can work together to kind of combat um, some of the stronger advertisings, advertisements that are available to children these okay. days. We have another clip from the Center for Media Literacy that deals with this uh, educating youngsters about uh, the effects of advertising, making them conscious of it. Let's take a look at that. So as you're filling in the various categories as you go along, start with the name of the product. At the middle school level, media education appears in many forms. Here, uh, students learn to think critically fun. about advertising. All right, we want you to list factual content, target audience. If you think there's a very specific, identifiable target audience, bait and hook. You can use a variety of things here. Magic words, okay? The words that tell you really nothing, but they sound terrific in an advertisement. And finally, disclaimers. Listen carefully for disclaimers. Ever since we've been a people, we've been telling stories, uh, analyzing stories, looking at literature. So media, advertising, all of the things we're talking about are just another form of storytelling that need to be analyzed. So to ignore that would be to, you know, just be sticking your head in a box and pretending that it's not there. And we can't do that. We have to acknowledge that it's there and we have to teach the kids how to, you know, analyze it and, and cope with it. Okay, now, so you're doing yours, uh, your, your angle on this is just strictly... On Nancy, oh, balanced news. Okay, now there you have a uh, classroom situation where they're teaching children about bait and hook. Mm -hmm. Give us, uh, give us a little bit of a sense of what that might involve. Um, it, it's very interesting watching that segment because um, I walked my students through something very similar to that process, and it was enlightening for me because um, I had never thought, um, never really gone that in depth into the advertisements to really think about uh, what type of manipulation they're, they're really trying to uh, pull. Um, and as, as an adult, I can see through that and learn th through that. And, but children don't have that capacity to put all the stories together. And so they'll, they'll hear, hear one story from one advertisement and a different story from another. And it was, it was difficult for the children to pull out the hidden meanings behind the advertising. So it, it is really important to, to take time to break down the advertising and think about how the persuasion model is being used within the advertisement and really what it's trying to get the child to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in other words, among other things, media education, media literacy for both children as well as adults is how to avoid the couch potato syndrome. <laughs> Did you say that's a fair description? Well, I want to be interesting with digital television when you're watching the, a television program or an advertisement and you're enticed to purchase the shirt of your favorite sitcom person or to order a pizza or it's on demand and it's during your program. It's dangerous. <laughs> it's important to, to understand. Oh, it's really? going to change. That's what digital uh, television will do. You can that'll just be order a part it immediately. Of it. Huh? That'll, be, that'll be a part of it. Not wow. on public television, but it'll be a part of the reality of media. Uh -huh. Is that what the interaction means, is you can order your pizza just instantly? PBS. Okay. Well, and also being able to manipulate, um, going back to old reruns of different shows, mm -hmm. and, and instead of having just a generic can of pop, having a Coca-Cola mm -hmm. or a Pepsi in You can hand. insert whatever you want to be there. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well. <coughs> <laughs> it's a whole other topic. Yeah, it, it is. It, yes, obviously, we we're just kind of touching the surface of it, but uh, it does give us a sense that there is something really revolutionary around the, country, uh, around the corner mm -hmm. here, don't, mm -hmm. isn't there? Big changes. And um, I think that um, in our closing moments, uh, this, uh, this conference is going to be uh, the next weekend, and it's open to the public, and people can take note of the the uh, information here as to how they might uh, take part in that. Um, you're, you've, you've been part of this planning process to bring this here. And I think they're forming 
It says unleashing creativity as the theme mm -hmm. for it. They're, they're trying to bring about a national media education alliance, as I understand yes. it. The Alliance for Media Literate America. Okay. And they want to, they're going to be, um, this is going to be the foundation for that. So the membership is open. Um, to ev anyone who is interested in joining that organization. Uh -huh. um, and this, this conference will become a yearly event, and um, there'll be information. There's a listserv that you can join as part of this organization. And I don't believe you have to be a member to be part of the listserv if you're interested in the, in the topic of media literacy. Mm -hmm. I know Steve Allen, the late uh, television personality, had started a, a, parents, a group for parents to try to offset some of the worst effects of pornography and violence on, on, on the television. Uh, this media literacy, though, is not just <clears throat> like trying to protest. It is trying to uh, raise consciousness, it sounds to me like. Is that, is that your understanding of what this involves, Nancy? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, raising consciousness, um, also trying to uh, take more of a critical, critical approach to it and not necessarily a critique um, not to condemn mm -hmm. um, certain right. programs, but to be able to understand the implications of what you're watching. Yeah. It's empowering the viewer. I have to tell you that uh, my experience as a local pastor, I started in Chicago on this before I came to Austin and <clears throat> was involved in a public affairs program like this there. But I began to realize that within the faith community, in the <clears throat> what was then the 20th, 20th century and now probably even more in the 21st century, to, to spirituality is inseparable from our relationship to the media. I mean, it's this all-encompassing environment, or this ocean, as it's been called. It's, I remember uh, one of the videos that we've used in the church. It's uh, like one fish asking another fish, well, what's it like for you living in the ocean? And this other fish saying, well, what ocean? I mean, we're so unconscious. Mm -hmm. It just surrounds us, and we breathe it in and out of our gills sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, to raise an awareness is a spirituality in itself. And I suspect, suspect that both of you, without necessarily putting a religious label on it, have been involved in something of the same process. And uh, your media literacy efforts through KLRU are mm -hmm. toward that end of raising consciousness, mm -hmm. are they not? They are. Um, just in through our through our programming itself that PBS produces, um, there's always a media literacy uh, component that comes along with those children's programs and the associated um, resources that are available through the website. It's all free and available to parents and okay, to teachers. Okay, so. good. Okay, thank you for coming today, Holly, sure. and sharing that with us. Holly Custard and Nancy Jennings, Dr. Jennings. <laughs> congratulations on getting your PhD. Thank you. And congratulations to you folks for watching us today. We've just been uh, enjoying sharing this, and we hope that you have too. Look forward to seeing you next week on Austin Faith Dialogue. I'm Richard Thompson, and bidding you peace.